purport. The conditioned souls within the clutches of the illusory energy are all anxious to attain peace in the material world, but they do not know the formula for peace, which is explained in this part of Bhagavad Gita. The greatest peace formula is simply this. Lord Krishna is the benefactory in all human activities. Man should offer everything to the transcendental service of the Lord because he is the proprietor of all planets and the demigods thereon. No one is greater than he. He is greater than the greatest of the demigods, Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma. In the Vedas, Shveta Shvatara Upanishad 6-7, it is said, Tam Ishvaranam Paramam Maheshwaram Under the spell of illusion, living entities are trying to be lords of all their, they survey. But actually, they are dominated by the material energy of the Lord. The Lord is the master of the material nature, and the conditioned souls are under the stringent rules of material nature. Unless one understands these bare facts, it is not possible to achieve peace in the world either individually or collectively. This is the sense of Krishna consciousness. Lord Krishna is the supreme predominator and all living entities including the great demigods are his subordinates. One can attain perfect peace only in complete Krishna consciousness. The fifth chapter is a practical explanation of Krishna consciousness, generally known as Karma Yoga. The question of mental speculation as to how Karma Yoga can give liberation is answered herewith. The work in Krishna consciousness is to work with complete knowledge of the Lord as the predominator. Such work is not different from transcendental knowledge. Direct Krishna Consciousness is Bhakti Yoga and Jnana Yoga is a path leading to Bhakti Yoga. Krishna Consciousness means to work in full knowledge of one's relationship with the Supreme Absolute. And the perfection of this consciousness is full knowledge of Krishna or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. A pure soul is the eternal servant of God as his fragmental part and parcel. He comes into contact with Maya, illusion, due to the desire to lord it over Maya, and that is the cause of his many sufferings. As long as he is in contact with matter, he has to execute work in terms of material necessities. Krishna consciousness, however, brings one into spiritual life even while one is within the jurisdiction of matter, for it is an erosion of spiritual existence by practice in the material world. The more one is advanced, the more he is freed from the clutches of matter. The Lord is not partial towards anyone. Everything depends on one's practical performance of duties in Krishna consciousness, which helps one control the senses in every respect and conquer the influence of desire and anger. And one who stands fast in Krishna consciousness, controlling the above mentioned passions, remains factually in the transcendental stage, or Brahma Nirvana. The Eightfold Yoga System, sorry, the Eightfold Yoga Mysticism is automatically practiced in Krishna consciousness because the ultimate purpose is served. There is a gradual process of elevation in the practice of Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. But this only prefaces perfection by devotional service, which alone can award peace to the human being. It is the highest perfection of life. And again, verse 529. A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the Supreme Lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities attain peace from the pangs of material miseries. Is there someone who is coming for the first time? Or everybody is coming to the <coughs> Okay, welcome. 
this Krishna consciousness movement is meant to help people to find alternative uh, way of thinking and also alternative lifestyle in these modern times. And we know that uh, modern lifestyle is quite intense, it requires more or less of our n n energy, physical energy, <coughs> mental energy, and not much time and energy left for thinking about the goal of life. <coughs> According to Vedic scriptures, Vedic books, the human life is meant for higher thinking and simple living. And nowadays this civilization is making the things completely the opposite way. Our living is quite complicated and our thinking is quite simple because there is no time to think about anything else than just work and eat and sleep and that's it. No time for anything else. <coughs> so the idea is that we should uh, try to mold or arrange our lifestyle in such a way that we have at least some time to make spiritual advancement. The founder Acharya of this movement, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada, one time he was on an interview and the uh, interviewer he asked <coughs> Swami Prabhupada, so is it true that in India people are dying on a much lesser age than the people in the West. And his idea was to show that actually the Western civilization is higher or more advanced or more developed than the civilization from the East. And Sri Prabhupada answered, well, according to my understanding, the debt is equal everywhere. It is 100%. <laughs> Because if you are born in the West or in the East, then it doesn't matter how long you live, but at the end, all of us will have to leave this comfortable situation and go somewhere else and do something else. So, uh, when the soul, the spiritual soul, comes here in this world, it is in a foreign environment. This is not the natural situation for the soul. The soul rather belongs to the spiritual reality, to the spiritual world. Where is God? And when we come here, we are exactly in a situation just like a fish who is out of the water. The fish cannot be happy if it's out of the water. No matter what do you do, you can feed the fish with amazing things, you can put the fish on an amazing Vyasa sound, give her a crown, gold rings, but the fish will not be happy because it's in a place where it's unnatural for the fish. So in the same way as a spiritual particles belonging to the spiritual atmosphere, as the souls who are part and parcels of God, here we don't feel exactly as we should feel. The soul wants to be eternally happy. But here in this place, the soul cannot be eternally happy. Like, let's say, for example, you create a very nice environment for you. It's exactly the place that you were dreaming a whole lifetime. And you arrange it completely in the way how you want to be arranged. And then, at some moment, someone comes and tells you you cannot stay anymore here. And you have to change your situation. You have to leave this place. You may like it very much, but at some point you have to leave. Someone may say, well, no, I arrange my place in such a way that I don't have to go anywhere else. Yes, but at some point, at the end of life, you have to go. 
you cannot stay always in this place. Or let's say we develop, we invest so much time to develop a ni nice relationships with different personalities in, a, in our life. Our friends, it can be our family, it can be just uh, people that are helping us. And this can be very safe environment for us. Yes, isn't it? All of us, we want to have friends and someone who can help us when we are in a difficult situation. But the situation in this material world is so that you cannot stay forever in this situation, in these relationships. Either you have to go at some point or the other person goes. Or sometimes both of you, you go at the same time in a different places, different directions. It is given example in Srimad Bhagavatam. Very often the relationships in this world, they are like two sticks, two straws swimming in a river and at some point just the water of the river makes them come together and they come together and they swim for a certain time but then at some other point of time they just split and go on their own way so that's the situation in the material world but the picture is not so grey as, as we describe it now because in the spiritual world there is no this restriction of time and space. In other words, if you like, you can stay in one place always, eternally. And if you like some people, you want to be with them always, eternally, you can do that. There is no problem. That's why we are saying that the needs of the soul cannot be completely satisfied here, in this place. Because wanting or not, we will have to change our situation. We will have to change our position. We will have to change our association with the time. It's unavoidable. So, if we understand this, that this place is not a place where gentlemen want to stay, and if we decide that we want to go to the spiritual world, then the question is how to do that. What is the way? What is the process to do it? And of course we know the process is Bhakti Yoga or Krishna Consciousness. This is the best process. There are many other processes that can, they can help you to advance spiritually and to go outside, outside of the material sphere of life. But this process is the fastest and is the most simple of all of them. Why it is so? Because in all other spiritual process, let's say like Karma Yoga or Ashtanga Yoga or Jnana Yoga, you depend on your personal strength to make the spiritual advancement. It depends on your qualification. If you are qualified 30%, you advance 30%. If you are qualified 50%, you advance 50%. That's it. You cannot advance more than as much as you are qualified. But in Bhakti Yoga, although we are putting endeavors, and the endeavors are very important, our advancement does not depend exclusively on our endeavors. Our advancement depends on the mercy of Krishna, on the mercy of the Lord. It is like, for example, let's say... <coughs> If you're a student and you want to get a good marks in your studies, in order to do it, you have to put endeavors. And if you study 50%, most probably you'll get half mark. If you study 100%, you'll get the best mark, isn't it? It's like that. But let's say, what if, let's say, the main, the principal of the school, the director of the school is your father or your mother? What about this situation? They can influence you a little bit. They can help if necessary. In other words, if you have connections, connections can help you. Or let's say you work in a job. And if you work eight hours, let's say they pay you, what, 10 euros or 20 euros per hour. And that's it. As much as you work, that much money you will get. Isn't it? Yes. 
But let's say, what about if, if the boss of the company is your father? Then, sometimes you may say, oh, today I'll just not go to work. But again, maybe they'll pay you at the end. Because you have connection. So the idea is that Krishna consciousness is like a spiritual connection. You have a connection with the highest authorities. And basically, if you are sincere and if you try to give your best, if at the end something is lacking, something is not enough, Krishna will help. That's why it is said that this Krishna consciousness, this practice is much easier and much faster. Uh, there is a verse from Bhagavad Gita that is saying, Bahonam Janmanam Ante Gyanavan Mam Prapalyante. Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudurlava. Someone may practice for many, many lifetimes, Bahunam Janmanam Ante, until he comes to the understanding that, okay, Vasudeva is everything, Supreme Lord is everything, and I should surrender unto him. So this realization may take many, many, many lifetimes. But Shio Prabhupada said, that if we are serious in Krishna consciousness, we can achieve perfection in one lifetime, in this lifetime. That's why uh, we know and we believe that Krishna consciousness can uplift you very fast, very, very fast. Shishi Gorni Tai Ki Jai, Shishi Buch Mahaprabhu Ki Jai, Shishi Gora Gora Ki Jai. So Shia Prabhupada in this verse, in the purport, he is explaining what is the essence of Krishna Consciousness. We know that the essence is, we should always remember about Krishna, about the Lord, and we should never forget about Him. This is the essence of this process of Krishna Consciousness. If we are able always to think about the Lord and never forget Him, we will advance very fast. And also it is said in one verse in Bhagavad Gita, Yat Yad Vapis Maram Bhavam Tyajati Ante Kalevaram Tam Tam Levaiti Kauntea Sadatan Bhavam Bhavitaha Whatever one remembers at the time of death, he will achieve such a situation of existence. In other words, if we are thinking about Krishna at the time of death, we will go to his abode, to his planet. Deva Deva Yejo Yanti. If one remembers the demigods, he will go to their planets. Or if one remembers the Pruta, the Buddhas and Pretas and Pishachas or demoniac living entities, you go to their boat, which is under the our earthly planets. So according to our thoughts, we will achieve certain destination. When the time of death comes, the soul will come out of the gross physical body and with, with, and with its subtle body will travel and we'll go wherever the soul desires to go. So Sri Prabhupada is saying, to think always about Krishna means three things. They are mentioned in this verse. We should always remember that Krishna is the supreme uh, proprietor of all planets, of the whole universe. We should always remember this. Bhaktaram Yagya Tapasam. He is also the supreme enjoyer. Whatever we are doing is meant to give pleasure to the Lord. And He is Suhridam Sarva Bhutanam. He is the best friend of everybody. He is our best friend. So basically, that means that we should understand God is the supreme controller and He is the supreme enjoyer. We are thinking that we are the Supreme Controller and we are the Supreme Enjoyer. Whatever we are doing normally, we are trying to come to this end that, okay, I want to enjoy it. Whatever I'm doing, it's for me. If I go to work now and if I get my money, 
I want to spend my money for me, not for anybody else. But the idea is that no, we should make our money and then use our money to do something for the Lord. In this way, we will not get any reactions from our activities. Otherwise, we will get some reaction from our work. And in the same way, when we are in difficult situation, we should know there is nobody who can help you except Krishna. No matter what happens, Krishna is always the best friend. Whatever he is doing, it's always for our good. This is 100% sure. There is such a story, maybe some of you know this story, it's a very interesting story. There was a king, Indian king, and he had his uh, minister, actually he was not a minister, he was rather making him jokes, like a joker. And uh, because he was a Vaishnava, he was a devotee of the Lord, whatever was going on around them, he was always saying one thing. Whatever God does, it's always for our good. Whatever God does, it's always for our good. <coughs> so one time, he was joking with the king. He had a knife in his hand and he was joking with the king that he's going to snap him. And without wanting, by chance, he cut the king a little bit. Not a lot, but he cut the king. And the king became a little angry. And then this joker, because he was a Vaishnava, he said, My dear king, whatever the Lord does, it's always for good. Don't be angry. So the king became even more angry. He said, What are you speaking? You, you just wanted to cut my hand and now you are saying it's for good. How this is for good? If you are saying everything that God does is for good, okay, then now I'm sending you to jail. Let's see how this is for your good. <coughs> and he sent the joker to the jail. Oops. Sorry. But so it happened. So it happened that uh, after a few days, the king went to the forest with his ministers. They went for hunting. And then there was a dacoits there. And the dacoits, they were worshippers of Durga Devi. Kali. Kali Ma. You know. So, thank you. So, you? No. so they decided that, okay, we want to make a special sacrifice to our goddess, Kali, Durga. <coughs> and if we manage to sacrifice a human being, this will be the best sacrifice. And they saw this king, and they, was, they were thinking, wow, if we are able to sacrifice in our... Uh, ceremony this king our goddess Durga will be so happy so they, they managed to call the king and next day they baited him they fed him and they were just about to cut off his head <coughs> he had to be the sacrificial animal for their ceremony and just about at that moment <coughs> they saw that he was cut. And in the Shastra, in the Holy Scriptures, it is said that if you're doing ceremony, the sacrificial animal should not have any kinds of cuts on his body. If he has, it's not qualified to be offered in the sacrifice. So they just kick out the king and tell him, just get out of here, you're useless, we cannot do anything with you. And then the king was so happy he came back to his kingdom, extremely happy. He immediately said, immediately, bring the joker here. Get him out of the prison. And then he said to the joker, actually, I'm so grateful to you. You saved my life. Because you cut my hand, you saved my life. Uh, now I understand that what you are saying, actually, it's true. Whatever God does, it's always for our good. But then I have one question. It was good for me because I was safe. But during these few days, you were in the jail. How it is that that was good for you? I cannot understand. You were just starving in the jail. It was cold. 
you said that this is also good, but how it is good, I don't understand. And then the Joker said, no, my Lord, it's very, very good. Because if I was not on, in the jail, I would be with you in the forest, and I didn't have any cut. So they would just slaughter me. <coughs> so we should have this understanding that Krishna is Sukhridam Sarvabhutana. He is the best friend of everybody. And because he has the highest intelligence in this universe, he knows what is best for us. And sometimes something happens in our life and we think maybe that was not the best thing to happen with my life. But as a devotee, we should know that no, if it happens, that means it's good for us. But me, we may not understand how it is good for us at the moment. But later, later maybe after five years or ten years, when we go back and when we see this situation, then we'll be able to understand. Now I understand actually this is something very good for me. So we should have this understanding that we should always try to remember God and never forget Him. And we should remember always these three features of God. That He is the Supreme Controller, He is the Supreme Enjoyer, and He is the best friend of everybody. If we can remember these three things always, that means we are perfect yogis. Nothing is lacking in our spiritual practice. And someone may say, okay, but if you live in the temple, in ashram, then it's easier to do that because the whole day you are engaged in practical activities, like you are singing about the Lord, or you are cooking about the Lord, or you are cleaning the temple of the Lord. But then, how it is if I'm working outside and I'm traveling three hours every day in the traffic, and I'm working like nine hours, something which is completely not connected with the Lord, then how to remember the Lord all the time? Can you explain this to me? Well, actually we should know that there is nothing that is not connected with the Lord. Everything is connected with the Lord. Otherwise, how He is the Supreme Controller of everything. Just we have to use our intelligence that God gives us to try to understand how every situation is connected with God and how we can connect this situation with God. Let's say, for example, if we are cooking, we can, uh, when we are shopping, we should see that the products that we are getting there, they can be, uh, later they can be spiritualized, they can be used to be made a food that can be offered to God. Also, we should try to get the best foods available. Not to get, let's say, the rotten food because it's like with three cents cheaper. No, get the good products, products in Sattva Guna. And then when we are cooking the uh, these dishes, we can think, Oh, when I cook now this preparation, I want to offer it to the Lord so that He enjoys the food first. 